Hi everyone and welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John DeTulio. And I'm Kristen Clapp. So far this spring, the RIT men's lacrosse team has stolen the headlines. Head coach Jay Coons Tigers entered their final regular season game with a perfect 14-0 record and ranked number two in the nation. RIT facing rival Nazareth on senior day in the first. Tigers trailing one zip. Eric Bressler with one of his three goals on the day to get the Tigers on the board. Tyler Russell also had a big afternoon for RIT. He scored three goals as well. As the Tigers completed their first perfect regular season in school history with a 13-5 victory over the Golden Flyers, clinching the Empire 8 and the top seed in the conference tournament. John, RIT was expected to have another great season, especially with three of their top four scorers returning this spring. But as Emily Clark discovered, the Tigers received an added bonus this year, thanks to a major contribution from one junior who unexpectedly emerged from the sideline to the spotlight. Tyler Russell was the all-time points leader at Livonia High School, so coming to RIT to clock bench time wasn't exactly what he had in mind. It sucks, but I mean, everyone's got to go through it. Um, I, you know, I tried to make the most of it, come to practice every day, put a smile on my face, cheer for the other guys right on the field, and uh, get in when they let me. Everyone takes their time on the bench. You know, I was playing behind a pretty good player in Sean Gillies, who was a All-American, so I mean, everyone has to pay their dues. Do you feel like your bench time made you a better player? Yeah, I mean, two years on the team, kind of playing with some of the better guys, some of the upperclassmen, I think it really, really benefited me. Um, and then this year, actually getting to go out and play with them in games kind of kind of shows. Understanding he had big shoes to fill, Russell knew he needed to make an impact immediately. With Tyler stepping in for one of your former standout players, Sean Gillies, how do you feel he was able to fit in so quickly in that position? Um, well, I mean, he was a good player last year. I mean, we didn't, uh, we wouldn't hesitate to put him in last year. I think the difference, again, is the, the confidence factor, uh, knowing that he has a starting position and a starting spot, and uh, he's really relishing it. He just saw the opportunity and, and took advantage of it. I tried to make it as, you know, as seamless as possible. He's a, he's a very good player, and everyone knows that. He had 50 goals or something last year, so I just tried to go in there and do my best. Russell's best has made him the team's top scorer. He's gone from just six goals his first two seasons to scoring 52 goals in 15 games this year. Can you tell us a little bit about the team's offense and how you feel you were able to fit in with them so quickly? Um, yes, uh, a lot of these kids have been playing together for two years, three years, some of them. And you know, like like you said earlier, Sean was a he was a good player, and I just wanted to model my game kind of after his. You know, go in there, finish the goal, finish the ball when, whenever they pass it to me. Um, you know, that's what he did, so I wanted to go out there and do the same thing. I think he keeps things loose, which is a good thing for the team. You know, we want to be focused and ready to go, but he, he keeps the team loose. He's got a great attitude. Just on the field, I, I, I think uh, he hustles on all his rides. He doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. And uh, again, burying the ball, I mean, that's that's what he does best. The biggest thing is he's, he's finishing his shots. Um, you know, there, there was a good opportunity there, a good void to fill, and he knew he had that opportunity. And uh, he's been really just burying his shots right from practice, right on through. Uh, the other change I've seen out of him is just his attitude, his mental attitude. He's playing much more confident ball. Uh, you know, he's, he's playing within the system, within the team schemes. And uh, he's finding open space and burying them. Still to come on Sports Zone, RIT takes aim at a world record. For the last eight years, John DeTulio has co-hosted RIT Sports Zone and recently has contributed to the RIT Hockey Broadcast as an analyst. But what you may not know is that John has been working as a sports broadcaster for over two decades in both television and radio. Last month, Sports Zone went behind the scenes of the John DeTulio Show to find out how the host got started in the business and how he continues to thrive in it today. Hey, good afternoon. 
Welcome to the program. Great to have you aboard. I am John DeTulio. How did I get into sports broadcasting? I went to college for it. And then when I got out of Penn State, the, uh, the TV station that I interned with gave me a job right out of college. Basically, bottom of the barrel. I was a photographer. I ran tapes. I did audio. I produced. I did whatever I had to do, but that's how I got started. And then it kind of evolved from there. Just took, I got my foot in the door and then I ran with it. My big break came actually was in radio. I always wanted to do radio. My cousin was a sales girl at a radio station in Erie. They were looking for a talk show host. My cousin told the program director to give my cousin a call. So he calls me back, interviews me on the phone. He starts asking me trivia. Next thing I know, I nailed this thing. He goes, what are you doing tonight? So I auditioned that night. We had about an hour phone call, ran down to the station, did the show that night, and says, you got the job. So that got my foot in radio, so they started hearing me. At my other TV job, we were sold. New management came in. News director heard me on the radio and goes, I want you to do that on TV. Can you? I go, yes. And then I became the 10 o'clock anchor for the Fox News down in Erie. And then the rest is history. I've been working full-time in radio and TV since 2000. But then I just went solely full-time radio in 2008. Typical day in radio, get up 20 to 5. Head to Dunkin' Donuts, get a cup of coffee. I work to about quarter to nine, go to the gym, come back here at around 2.15, 2.30, do my show. Then I'm out at six. I'm either home for dinner by 6.30 or I'm doing you know, RIT hockey at seven o'clock. It's a lot of fun, I'm very, very lucky. I, I don't look at it as a job. I may be running here or there, but even when I was working TV at say our news and at Fox and I was working radio, it really wasn't, I didn't think of it as that much of a long day because I was having so much fun doing it. My favorite part of the job here is when the light goes on, because then I can just be myself. You are in control. What guy or girl doesn't want to be in control of their own show? I can say just about anything I want. I, I form, I have my opinions, be entertaining, do what you want to do. That's the best part is when the light goes on, I'm in control and I basically am in control of the show. Most challenging part is trying every day to make it, to make it entertaining, make the show move, somewhat controversial, having the best guest on, you really gotta put so much into it. That's the toughest part is when from, for three hours, you gotta make every segment the best segment you can do. That's the toughest part, yet it's the most rewarding part. Because when you, you, when you sign off at six, you feel like a rush, like, wow, we had a great show, but you gotta come back and do it again tomorrow. Can't wait, I'm in a very good mood today, Danny. What's that mean? Normally we have a big show, Billy. Good workout equals good show. That's what you got to think about. What's everybody talking about? What's your audience? What's going to generate feedback? What's going to generate calls? That's how you got to go into every show. We get the most calls when we talk football. If, if I came on the show today and started talking NFL, phone lines would, would light up. I do love football, but I do love basketball, baseball, hockey too. But um, football generates the most calls. So that's my favorite sport to talk about. Name a quarterback taken late who's elite today even if you want a, a good backup quarterback i mean think about stafford first round cutler first round you got to be prepared i don't like to come in here and wing it i think you, you come in here prepared know what you're going to talk about and then boom and kind of put it in your own little niche little flavor on it. put a little put a little salt and pepper on it make it a little spicy as well number one i always tell people find a place where you feel comfortable where they kind of get you and you can carve a niche, and I think this town is perfect. I love this town. I'm not going anywhere. I'm doing everything I want to do. I got my own show. I talk Bills. I talk Syracuse. I've got Division One hockey to talk about. I've got Yankees to talk. I'm doing everything I would do in a larger market. So I've got no complaints whatsoever. This is a great town. I got great support here. My wife's from here. I'm not going anywhere to be part of Sports Zone, which is a show now that's been around for, what, nine years? I mean, it's tremendous. And the one thing I will say about RIT and about everybody involved, when they do something, it's top notch. And who doesn't want to be a part of that? They do everything top notch down there. And it's been great to watch it evolve and grow over the last, for me, eight years.
Gallaudet University and NTID here at RIT are leading institutions in the education of the deaf and hard of hearing. For decades, each institution has alternated as host of a weekend filled with friendly competitions and social activities. As Olivia Angerosa found out, it's an event that continues to unite both schools. The RIT vs. Gallaudet Sports Weekend is a long-standing tradition that NTID students look forward to each year. Teams from both schools face off in many competitions to see who is the best. So what does this event mean to all the people involved? Um, it's a very, very special event because a lot of the people who participate, um, they get to see their friends from Gallaudet University. And Gallaudet University is another school that's just like RIT that has a big deaf population. And uh, before going to a college, most of these kids went to high school together or went to summer camp together and they haven't seen each other for a long time. So when we come together, there's a special feeling we just go all out competing. Of course, there are some people that don't know one another and it's time to make new friends. And it happens every year. So it's really important to, you know, recognize both colleges and what they both offer. To see them compete and us win and stay friends afterward is a good feeling. And how many students participate in this event? Total fan, athletes, referees, coaches, committees. You're looking at probably over a thousand people. You should have seen last night pep rally. Clark's gym, half of it was full. Students packed up on the floor, on the bleachers. It's an easy thousand. The purpose of the RIT Gallaudet Sports Weekend is that this is where we unite the uh, communities, the deaf communities between RIT and NTID and Gallaudet University in Maryland. Uh, once a year, we take turns uh, playing sports um, here at RIT, and then the other year we play at Gallaudet University. Uh, we play a bunch of various sports such as softball, soccer, uh, volleyball, racquetball, whatever it is, we got it. It's to get the uh, deaf community together. And it's something to really enjoy together. It's a lot, a lot of interaction, a lot of friendship. You know, we want to keep that friendship too. As PR coordinator, what kind of things do you do to promote the event? Oh, we do a lot of fun things. Um, I get a, um, a committee together, and what we do is uh, we come up with um, designs for ads and uh, flyers uh, for everything. And we, uh, we post them up. We use Facebook. We, we also use social media networking. It's, uh, it's all about letting people know so they can participate as easy as possible. What is your role as chairman for the event? Basically, my role is to make sure this weekend happens. And I got to set up the committee with different roles, you know, like the coordinators for the sports and the coaches and everything, and varies. Those roles really make sure that the teams are set up, the hotel is working for everyone, for like Gaudet, the food. It all requires like all the work together for the weekend. I support, that's it. Questions, problems, they can't figure out, yeah, you know, I give them some feedback. But it's all theirs. I'm only there for support and to cheer them on. Obviously both teams want to win, but is this more about fun or more competition? It's, uh, it's extremely mixed, but it's more on the competitive side. We always, um, Gallaudet does the same thing. We always taunt our opponent because this is only one day we're playing, only one day we want to meet the best of it. And when we come play, we see who's the top. Why do you think there's so much competition between both sides? Uh, why? Because they know we're good. I don't know. Um, pride. It's a lot of pride. They say a lot of relationship comes from the students who go to Gallaudet have a strong, strong relationship. Students who come here, yeah, they do too, you know. They want to defend their school name. They, they want to take pride in their own school. So, of course, we're going to be competitive, and we're going to win. Do you miss competing in the event? Oh, oh, yes. All five years, undergrad, I participated in the weekend. I did coaching. I did chairperson. I did all the other stuff. I did coaching for men's softball, too. The first three years, I love the boys. I love coaching. It's hard. 
It's hard that I can't help right now, you know, but I volunteer to help. It's good. I'm still there cheerleading and supporting them. And what is the importance of the rivalry between both schools? The show who's the best. The one the trophy, it's plain and simple. What kind of positive impact does it have on both schools? The passive impact is um, it's a lot of school spirit. There's a lot of uh, emotions involved, but there is um, a little bit of professionalism behind it. We both know it's just a game. It's just a, it's just a bunch of sports, and we know we're here to have a good time. But at the same time, we do not want to waste our time just playing 50%, um, uh, just playing 50% on the sports. We all want to go 110% out of respect for one another. So what would you tell people who don't know much about this event? Well, it's a long-lasting tradition that's been happening for many years, and Gallaudet and RIT, you know, they always come here every year, and they just do it despite the rain. You know, people love to be competitive. They love the sport, and they love the deaf community. It's one of the good things. So who do you think is going to win this weekend? Of course, RIT, the Tigers. Welcome back to Sports Zone. Now, the Guinness Book currently holds 4,000 of the world's top records and achievements. As Kristen Clock reports, a large portion of the RIT community showed up to take its best shot at rewriting history to make this university the king of dodgeball. to set the world record for the largest dodgeball game ever recorded. The event, hosted by Phi Kappa Psi and Dodgeball Club, is looking to break the University of Alberta's record of 2,012 people. What's this event? Can you tell us a little bit about it? This, today, at May 1st at the Gordon Field House, we're breaking the, in fact, we have broken the world record for the largest dodgeball game ever played in the history of mankind. You know, as soon as the game is over and uh, we file the paperwork, the record is official. How many people came to participate in this event today? Uh, over 2,116 people are playing right now. That's a lot of people, I guess. <laughs> How did you come up with the idea for this? I watched, um, I believe it was February of last year, one, uni a university in California, they broke the record. So I said, that would be cool if we did it here. Someone said, go to the fraternity that, that runs a the motor. They have the facility and they can do this. They, they can actually make this happen. Sat down with them, they said, we'll try it. And we've been meeting ever since. Uh, last year, September. And what's it take to organize an event of this magnitude? You need a lot of committed people. You need a lot of people that are dedicated to the cause. Every Saturday we would meet. And you know, a lot of people tell us, we couldn't do this. You know, a lot of people told us that. And slowly but surely, you know, people were, people uh, changed their minds. The biggest thing was getting the people interested, you know? In the beginning, it was kind of slow, but as soon as the days got closer, a lot of more people got interested. And we got a lot of support from everybody. Uh, we also had to got, get about 50 witnesses who don't work for RIT, and that was a task in itself. And uh, we got them all. They're sitting on the stage witnessing the event. So this event will be legitimate with Guinness World Records. So are you witness for the event today? Yes, yes, I am. And how did you get chosen? Did you volunteer for that? I volunteered for it. When we were waiting outside, I said, well, I'll just be a witness rather than participate. So I have, I have to, I had to sign something. It's very official and turn it in. I had to say that I was going to stay here for the entire match and watch it. So yeah. So what brought you guys out to this event today? Uh, I'm an RIT alum, and I just want to show my pride at RIT and set the world record. I'm friends with Dan. I uh, graduated from Fisher, and uh, I just love dodgeball. Can you explain your outfits today? This, what you're seeing right here, is Ultimate Warriors just like the, the World Wrestling Federation champion. What are you guys looking forward to most? Uh, setting the world record, but also show everyone what RIT is all about. I'm just looking <laughs> to have some fun. Yeah. How did you decide who got on what team? Um, we kind of randomized it when you came in, or you can sign them as a group. The Dodgeball Club decided they all wanted to be orange, so we're, most of us are on the orange side. So what team do you think is going to win? Dodgeball Club team, the orange team. I'm on the. 
sports team. What does an event like this do for the RIT community? Oh, I think it's a great event. It's a great day to be here. I'm so excited that everybody got here and we broke the record and it's really fun. It's a little dangerous out there. I think it's just the energy. I mean, you hear all these people. I mean, they're into it. What's your favorite part about the event? Anybody can play dodgeball. And lots of people showed from every college, from every year. We're very well represented, so it's great. What does it mean to you to be a part of breaking the record? You know, we get to be in the Guinness Book of World Record. It's something fun to do on a Sunday. I mean, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be at home sitting doing nothing. So I'd rather be out here. I'm just glad I'm a part of it, you know? I don't know, I wish I could have won, but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> I hope, hopefully they do this again and try and smash the record that we broke today. It's, this event is a great unifying experience for, for RIT. You know, we have athletes here, we have Greeks here, we have, you know, the deaf communities, you know, strongly represented. So it's really just a, a, a best way to have fun and just unify the whole campus, and not many events are able to do that. It's really just about making history, leaving a legacy behind, and, you know, people will remember us for years to come. Do you think this will become an annual thing? I feel like University of Alberta is going to beat it again, or try to beat it actually again, and uh, we might go back and forth. It might be a cool rivalry. People are already talking about next year and how we can get more numbers. It's nice to have it with the spring weekend. Um, I think people are here on campus. It might be fun to think about for Brick City weekend and have parents involved and family members. So we will definitely be doing it again next year. The game took nearly two hours, and in the end, the orange team was victorious. As for the record, RIT now holds the title for the largest game of dodgeball in history with 2,136 participants. That's an impressive record. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT Sports Zone. Don't forget for the latest episodes and more, we're always on at RITSZ.com. And you can also stay up to date with Sports Zone by following us on Twitter and friending us on Facebook. So until next time, thanks for joining us here in the Zone.